Hi, everyone. Um, Marcel Laflamme uh, from PLOS, uh, glad to be here today. Um, thanks for organizers, thanks to Dan in particular for, for kind of putting the session together. Um, so yeah, um, I'm part of the, the open research team at PLOS, so we are thinking about increasing the adoption of open science practices um, across PLOS's portfolio, um, and, and our remit, I guess, is broad in thinking about how we do that. So, so policy can be a piece of that, um, technology solutions like the kind that, that Eric was talking about can be a piece of that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're sort of in a position to think kind of portfolio-wide about how to, how to accomplish that goal. Um, and so, you know, the, the building blocks of that, when we think about data sharing in particular, um, you know, some of those building blocks, I think, um, yeah, map nicely onto some of what Erica shared with us. Um, you know, so, so there's a policy piece. Um, you know, going back to 2014 at PLOS, um, we've had a data availability policy um, you know, that, that data needed for replication is available, um, or authors are indicating how others can access it. And again, available on request is not, is sort of not what we're driving at there. Um, you know, we can think about dedicated article types that, that help researchers to disseminate and to get recognition for, for sharing data sets, and those are available on some of our journals. Um, a discovery piece, I think, is something we're, we're increasingly thinking about. Um, we have a, an experimental new feature um, that we're calling accessible data um, that really aims at connecting readers to data that has been deposited in repositories because we see that as a, as a better practice. Um, so yeah, really trying to make those data sets visible um, at the point of access um, on the published article itself. But I guess what I want to talk about today is not so much those building blocks which are, are kind of part of the toolkit that we all have available to us as, as publishers today. Um, but instead, I'm, I, I kind of want to talk about the need for better tools to measure open science. And I think this goes to, to some of what we heard from Sonia earlier. Um, you know, a couple studies here that I'll point to, um, the one on the left that goes back to 2019, so a study of European research funders. Um, and the question that was put to them is, what prevents you from monitoring um, the, you know, your, your open science policies and, and, and compliance with them? Um, you know, so the, the, the biggest response that they got was around lack of ad adequate monitoring infrastructure. Um, some of my colleagues at PLOS did a study a couple of years later um, and uh, of both funders and institutions and sort of similar findings, right? So it's very labor intensive, it's a very manual process. Um, so that's really one, one need that I think we're trying to respond to as a publishing organization. Um, yeah, is that if we, if we wanna promote open science, we need to figure out how to empower funders and institutions as our partners um, in, that, in that mission and sort of helping to, to address that challenge that they report experiencing. So that was sort of the, the origin in some ways of what we call this Open Science Indicators Project that I'll talk to you about today. Um, and if, you know, thinking about the goals kind of on this time scale, right? So, so there's kind of an internal facing piece of Open Science Indicators at PLOS. Um, you know, that's first of all about improving our ability to measure the success of particular solutions, right? So if we launch a, an integration with some other repository, we need to measure whether that's working, we need to measure if that's moving the needle in the way that we, that we want to see it. Um, by segmenting data on adoption, um, we're able to understand differences in rates of adoption across different research communities, right? So whether that's by field, whether that's by region, um, and then that can become the starting point for co-creating new open science solutions with them, right? So the observational data alone doesn't get us there, but at least in, if we can understand those differences in rates of adoption, that can be the starting point of a conversation with the community. Um, you know, as we go out a little bit further into the longer term, I think that, that our, our goals here are more external facing. Um, you know, Data like this on, on adoption allows us to support initiatives outside of PLOS, right, with reliable data. Um, and so here policymakers are, are really um, an important audience that we have in mind. Um, and again, with kind of increasing adoption of open science globally, so not just for PLOS authors, right, but for researchers at large as really the, the end goal. Um, and in that sense, we see kind of monitoring and measurement as part of our theory of change, right? So that's how we get to, to, to that goal. 
um, give you a kind of an overview of the approach we've taken so far. Um, and we've got a, a QR code there if you want to take a look at, at kind of our most recent public data release, just to really kind of um, get, a, get a look at, at what we've done so far. Um, so yeah, a year and a half back now, I would say we did a pilot um, on one journal and with one open science practice, with code sharing in particular. Um, we had put a, a code sharing policy in place at, at PLOS Computational Biology, and we wanted to be able to measure the difference that that policy made, right? So looking at that before and after and being able to see um, it, it, its impact. Um, based on the, the success of that pilot, and this was using um, this kind of natural language processing approach um, to, to, to look at um, code sharing at scale, so across the, the entire kind of published output of the journal, um, you know, things looked good. This looked like a promising approach. Um, we then kind of defined some requirements for it, which I'll, I'll share on the next slide. Um, sought community feedback on the approach that we were taking. Um, and after a, a RFP process, um, selected Data Seer as our, as our partner in developing this. Um, so we've now done two public releases of, of the data um, covering three open science indicators, right? Three different practices. So at this point, we're measuring rates of data sharing, rates of code sharing, and rates of preprint posting. Um, we have four years of data so far, going back to 2019, um, across the entire PLOS corpus, as well as a smaller comparator corpus um, that we're drawing from PMC. And just to, to say a little bit about kind of the principles that are guiding, you know, how we, how we operationalize this, um, I'll just touch on a couple of them. I think measuring what and how open science practices are being carried out now, that sort of speaks, I think, to, yeah, what do we do with supplemental information? Well, we know it's not, it's not an ideal way to share, um, but it's also something that we know a lot of authors are doing. So yeah, we've sort of made the decision that, that ways of sharing that are considered suboptimal are still things we wanna know about, are still things that we wanna track. Um, even as you know, we're, there, there, there's an intention of, of, of helping to support authors in moving towards sort of better practices of sharing. Um, an approach that's scalable, certainly that, that kind of fits in with our, our theme over the last couple of days. Um, you know, there, there are efforts out there to do this kind of at the journal level, looking at sort of a few key journals um, that are important within particular disciplines. Um, you know, we, we really wanted to do this at scale and we think, we think that's an important piece of this. And just the last piece around using these indicators responsibly, right? So we, you know, we're, we're not interested in putting up a leaderboard of sort of who's sharing the best or who's sharing the most. Um, we really see this as a way to, to understand particular communities and to support improvement, um, but not to sort of rank or, or um, even at this point to enforce compliance within the organization. So this is really more of a, a tool to understand. Um, so in the time I have left, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about what we've discovered about data in particular so far. Um, so yeah, looking at the first four years of data from comparators, right? So this is this um, subset of articles that we're getting from PubMed Central. So we're seeing, you know, a bit of growth just over this past four year period. Um, yeah, numbers dipped a little bit between 21 and 22, but just shy of 50% um, of articles that we're looking at that have shared data to compare that to the PLOS corpus. So we're seeing, yeah, I mean, you can see a, a gap there. So upwards of 70% of, of published PLOS articles um, with data shared, um, you know, and, and certainly like the influence of a strong publisher policy, uh, you know, is, is one thing that, that we understand to be driving that. So it's, you know, that's not a surprise, but it's good to be able to document and, and to quantify. Now, you know, a, as a publisher that has a data availability policy across the board, a question might be, well, why isn't there 100%? Uh, sort of adoption of that policy. And that's certainly something we're interested in, in digging more deeply into, but I would say there's a few things going on here, right? These kind of ethical and legal restrictions on what can be shared. I think we don't wanna regard that as the end of a conversation and, and not sort of saying, you know, well, then that data we can just forget about. Um, but I think it allows us to say, you know, what are sensitive forms of data um, that authors may have concerns about and what are other ways that we might be able to share pieces of that or to share that under um, controlled access conditions. Poor metadata and, you know, certainly a piece of non-compliance, right? We're not, we're not pretending that, that we get it right 100% of the time either. But then the other question, and, you know, this goes again to kind of recognizing where we stand now and where we'd like to be, 
um, you know, if we look at how data, is you know, how often data is shared well, this gap, so it's sort of a busy graph, but right, so the, the dotted lines at the bottom, um, you've got data de deposited in a repository, um, and then the top solid lines, data that's shared somewhere at all, right? And so that gap is substantial, right? So, so looking at the proportion of data that's shared as SI on lab websites, sort of in, in all, all manner of places, right, repository sharing, um, you know, so, so for the PLOS data set, just over 20%, for the comparator data set, just over 10%, those are lower numbers, right? And so, so I think this points in part to the importance of where data is shared and, and to, um, to supporting kind of um, the adoption of better practices over time, um, even as we think it's valuable to understand both of those trend lines. So I'll just close here and, and yeah, again, talk a little about what's next. Um, one thing that my team has been doing, and I, I wanna be kind of candid about this, is, is really kind of socializing this data within our organization um, as KPIs that the whole organization stands to care about, right? And that, that just as we would look to subs and pubs or we would look to waiver rates or, or other kind of metrics to say what kind of year did we have, right? really thinking about the adoption of open science as, as a way that we would answer that question of what kind of year did we have. That's a culture shift, I think, within publishing organizations. Um, so thinking about this data in those terms as well as as a source of business intelligence, right, and as a way to sort of um, understand where opportunities might be for PLOS. We are in the process of developing kind of our next, our fourth open science indicator, um, which will be around step-by-step -step protocols, so around methods sharing. Um, we should have data on that by the end of the summer. Um, I'd say we're exploring use cases kind of outside of the, outside of PLOS, um, you know, funders, institutions. We've had some nice conversations with librarians recently, um, how data like this can sort of support efforts to promote open science within institutions, but from the library perspective. And then I guess the point I wanna kind of leave us on is, is I would say we are really interested in exploring the potential for cross publisher collaboration around measuring and monitoring open science adoption. Um, so for me, like the value of this corpus increases the bigger it gets, right? Um, and, and the more that we can sort of compare, um, yeah, sort of beyond just sort of one publisher and the relatively small kind of corpus of, of comparative articles that we're looking at at this point. So I guess, yeah, as we move into the, the discussion, that's something I would be really curious to hear from folks in the room about. Um, you know, to what extent is this a priority within your, your organization? Um, you know, if it's not, why? What, what might some of the barriers be? Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much and um, yeah, look forward to, to talking more.